Hello and welcome. It's Alexa Linton here, your host for the Whole Horse Podcast. We're here to look at all the ways that the horse industry is changing before our very eyes in very cool, very amazing ways. And we're chatting with the people at the forefront of that change, the professionals, the trainers, the body workers, the researchers that are helping our lives with horses become better and better. Thanks for being here. I love that you're here and listening and learning. And if you ever have a guest that you want to suggest or a topic that you want to hear, just let me know and I'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. It means a lot. And I look forward to seeing you for season four. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Whole Horse Podcast. It's Alexa Linton here, and I'm very excited to have you back and really, really pleased to be here uh, with uh, Mona. Um, And I'm going to let Mona share a little bit more about her work, but I'm really, really happy that you're here today. We finally tracked down a time to, to chat, so thank you for being here. You're very welcome. And I'm so happy to be part of the podcast. What you do is amazing. <laughs> oh, it's such a pleasure. It's such a yeah. pleasure. So, so Mona's tuning in here from a little spot she just shared with me called Blackwater Valley, way, way up in the interior of British Columbia here. And uh, it sounds kind of, uh, kind of gorgeous up there. You were sharing a little bit more. So Mona, will you please share just a little bit of your of your story of, of sort of your journey with horses. It sounds quite fascinating. I'd love to hear more about it. Sure. My journey started probably the day I popped out of the womb. Uh, I did not realize it, of course, but it, by the time I was three and a half or four years old, my parents had to go and buy a horse because they couldn't keep me at home. I was totally attracted to horses and I seemed to have this antenna that led me to wherever they were. And my parents, after the last time they found me four and a half miles away as a toddler, decided that they had no recourse but to get a horse so they could keep me in the yard. And that was kind of where it started. I have always had this connection and horses have, when I'm around them, I'm at home. That's exactly where I'm supposed to be and nowhere else. And uh, they speak to me. Uh, the, uh, the language is just so comforting. So if I were to compare a human language and the horse language, the human language is so convoluted. The horse language is so pure and so honest. And so energetically, that connection is, I don't even have words to describe mm. what it feels like. It's so powerful and meaningful. Mm. And so that's wh- how I started. And um, it wasn't long before people are bringing me horses because they can't do anything with them and they want me to do something with them. And um, so that was kind of my journey. And uh I trucked along and did amazing things. I, I um, spent lots of times in the mountains with uh, guiding and doing stuff like that with horses. And then I was part, I was lucky enough to be part of the Gold Rush Trail Ride where we rode from uh, uh, New Westminster all the way to Barkerville with paying guests and horses of all different types of nature. <laughs> and the mm-hmm. horse I took on that ride was unbroke. She had never been ridden uh that's how we started that trek and um so yeah so that's been my journey and then in 1998 i had a really serious accident and i i got what they call a moderate traumatic brain injury Mm. and so that pretty much left me for a couple of years not being able to speak or walk And then I had to relearn everything. And when that process took away a huge part of my uh, ability to work with the horses, because my processing 
was maybe a seven day delay. So when you're used to connecting energetically, to have that delay felt to me like a blank space, like it was empty. Mm. And uh, my balance was bad, so riding was pretty much out of the picture. And the mare that I had taken on the Gold Rush Trail ride, I still had her. And, and she got so tired of grabbing my pant leg and dragging me back on and helping me stay on that eventually she just looked at me and said, you're not even getting on. This is stupid. <laughs> and mm. so for a long time, I didn't ride. And then um, a friend of mine... I got my very first horse from he showed up and said well you know i'm putting my ducks in a row here and uh, i need a home for my horse and you're the only person i can trust and if you say you'll give him a forever home he'll have that so i i of course said yes because he's old and dying so the horse must be old well it wasn't it was a two-year-old stallion that arrived <laughs> <laughs> and, and so there I began because I, I said, oh, well, he can just be a lawn ornament. But that didn't take long. And I thought, oh, I can't do that to him. So I had to muster up to the plate here. And um, yeah, I had a lot of work to do <laughs> to get me to a place where I could even remotely be what he required because he um, has really high self-preservation issues and, and uh, probably the highest out of any animal I've ever been around. So he had forced me to the top of my game, let me tell you. <laughs> Anyhow, him and I are still going strong and, and um, as I, I'm continually recovering because I discovered hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and uh, so the more I recover, the better he is. And um, so we're, the two of us are works in progress. But at this stage, I've, I've far enough along in my recovery that I've learned an awful lot about how important we are to the relationship and how everything that we see is a reflection on us and so if we're not getting what we want we have to figure out why because it is us <laughs> and so the better we can become the better everything is and so my je journey with gemini really cemented that and continues to cement that and that's kind of what got me on the track to offering my partner up workshop mm. wow i'm just yeah. imagining you as a little toddler running running down the road to find horses i think there was many of us that had that that inkling but maybe not to the 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 quite the draw to do it so um, i'm imagining that and 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 also the i can only imagine the um, what that it would have been like to, in in a way, lose those abilities or those gifts that you had in connecting, and and also the journey to to kind of finding them again, right? So, um, yeah, can you can you share a little bit more about that? So so what I mean, what a what a amazing way to help teach others. Um, I mean to kind of go, what did I have? And, you know, what, how do I get back to, to where I was or in a, in a way? So, so what did that look like for you? Well, I'll start back kind of when I was a teenager. And uh, so my relationship with horses, what I thought was normal, I, I thought this was what it was like for everybody. So if I went to school and I rode my horse to school and then I took the bridle off, my horse would be waiting for me when I got out of school. They were just, they, they might go do things, but they innately would know when I was getting out of school and they'd mm. be there for me. Or I'd take my horses camping and I never had to tie them up. I never, they were just staying wherever I was because we were, 
a unit. We were doing things together. And so I had experiences that I realize now most people, that's their dream. That's, you know, they would do almost anything to have that kind of experience. And I, of course, just thought, well, this is what this is all about. This is, this is normal. And uh, so with that connection and the energetic way of communicating, when that was lost from the accident, I was lost. I... I was, I guess the best way to describe it would be like, I felt like I was not connected anywhere. I like, I wasn't grounded. I, I was free floating and my entire life, my purpose work has always been to make things better for people. Mm or animals and so that left too and so for the longest time i probably about eight or nine years i was just blank and i i guess you just feel like you're it's not even like a depression but you just cut off mm -hmm. and and because i didn't realize what i had I didn't fully understand what I was cut off from. Mm -hmm. All I knew was that it was empty. And when I had my first um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy session, I, I got out of the chamber and I felt people's energy in the room. Um, and then everything here started to change too and i guess i'll back up again a little bit besides just having the brain injury you know along the, that journey i also developed ptsd mm. and um that was not easy and i i'm i am strong like even with all this stuff happening to me i am strong i am not a quitter and i i don't struggle with energy to keep putting one foot forward i i seem to have an abundance of that and i always have but ptsd i i don't understand why you give something so traumatic four letters to describe it because i and i guess part of my life journey has been to go through so many things so the empathy that i have is on a different level other than the empathy that I get from feeling emotions and energy. Mm. So, yeah. And so all of those things have kind of brought me to where I am. So when I teach about something, it's coming from me and my journey and what I've learned. And part of what makes that so powerful is me so i'm this curious little aunt <laughs> that mm -hmm. runs around and if somebody says that can't be done well then i have to understand why it can't be done and in that journey i of course figure out that it can be done mm -hmm. and so what i've figured out in this journey really really works and is something everybody can use to make a difference in their lives so i can honestly say when i was trying to improve my life prior to getting my energy back and the understanding of the gifts that i had i was trying to use books and uh it was fell flat to be honest <laughs> <laughs> and so this is so much better so i actually have ways to help you live without ptsd or anxiety or um depression and and they work and, and they work because of the physiological way our bodies navigate 
all of these different things. So by understanding the physiological responses, I was able to kind of find ways to almost totally eliminate the psychological aspects that create so much distress for us. Yeah. And, it, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, with, with your accident and the, that sense of, yeah, essentially having PTSD from the accident. I think that is something that affects a lot of riders and a lot of horses as well um, in terms of, you know, experiences they've had traumas. I know I've worked with a lot of horses with, you know, I, I don't think there's a, like a diagnostic that says this horse has PTSD, but they're, you know, we can tell that they're shut down or, um, you know, in, in a high level of, of, of stress response um, or reactivity. Um, in those cases, you know, with what you've learned through, through, your time since the accident, what, what do you do what, um, for yourself and what do you offer up, you know, for those people or horses that are experiencing something similar? Uh, what I do for myself, I do a lot of things for myself because as you're well aware, if I'm not awesome to myself, I can't be awesome to anybody else. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, as somebody that wants to help everybody, you have to be very careful because you cannot let your glass run empty. You need to ensure your glass is always full. And so in order to do that, I really work hard at never letting my power slip away. Mm. And we can we can diminish our power so easily you know we have a negative thought in our brain how we talk to ourselves our self-talk sometimes mm -hmm. is so powerful and so and allowing other people to take more than what they should take is another really powerful diminisher on our our power so when we can stay, I focus on staying grounded. I practice gratitude all the time because life is full of everything that you need. When you need it, you just need to be open enough to accept and acknowledge and realize that it's actually there. So you can't chase something. You have to allow yourself to get to a place where there's acceptance that it's going to be there when you need it not because you have a time ta timetable but because that's when it's meant to be for you and so I practice those things and none of them are easy I have to work at it every single day to keep me so that my energy is as powerful as it can be mm. and with my animals i have to practice acceptance and that means it doesn't matter if i think well i'm going for this kind of ride today i have to check in and i have to see where they're at and how they're feeling today and what they're actually capable of today because i i only want to work with i don't want to do two so that means I have to acknowledge how they're feeling. And if they're not into that energetic ride that I really wanted, well, then I have to be happy with the kind of ride that they're willing to provide me with that day and maybe do something to maybe towards the end, I might be able to get what I was going for because I've gotten them into a place where they're actually willing to give that. And not just because I demanded it, but because they really want to do it for me. Mm. And, and that's a, a really different place than where most people work with their horses because they go out with a goal in mind and then it becomes about what they want to accomplish, not about where their horse is at that moment in time. And mm -hmm. so they, 
they forget to ask. Mm -hmm. And, and so I guess that's how I work with my horses. I ask and I negotiate so that we can kind of get to where we, we, where I want to go and want to take them. Yep. But it's a negotiation and they have to feel like they're equal. Otherwise they lose interest because I know I don't do very well when somebody's busy telling me how it's going to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and so I, I guess in a little bit of a nutshell, I, that's what makes me different is the acceptance level and, and I'm okay that they tell me I don't want to today because I'll try to figure out why they don't want to. And then I'll try to see if there's something else I could do to kind of change their mind and kind of bring them around to where they're going. Yeah. All right. Bring it. I'm ready. And mm -hmm. so we go through life like that. And, um, energetically sometimes that takes a lot of work mm -hmm. and um but it's worth it i find it very very rewarding because having a willing partner means everything to me and so my horses because i'm short you know i'm five foot half an inch i gotta add that half an inch right <laughs> Um, they know <laughs> that I can't get on. So if I have to go pee or something and I'm riding it, all I have to say is, gee, you guys, I have to go pee. And they start looking for a stump because they know they need to deposit me on something so that I can get off so I can go. And then when I climb back up on the stump and I go, well, you got to come closer. You know, they look to see where they are and they line themselves all up and they ensure I can get on. And that kind of willingness doesn't happen because I, I want them to do that. It happens because they want to do that. And so all the work that I do is about getting them into a mindset where they want to. They they see value in this and they, they want to have that, that connection, just like I want to have that connection. Mm, mm. So it be, becomes a two way street. And, and I guess that's why I'm so big into when I go out to catch my horse and it doesn't want to be caught. I immediately go, okay, I rode yesterday. What happened on that ride? What is my horse trying to say to me? Like, there's a reason why they're walking away. And it has nothing to do with my body language or how I'm approaching them because those are skills that I have that are innate and I don't even think about. So I, I don't have to consider those. But if I was... Um, someone else that'd be my first question so what was in your mind what was your intent for the day what was your energy when you walked out there what was your body language saying so i immediately start from a place that's at a much deeper level trying to figure out well what happened and why do they not think this is the greatest thing to want to come out that gate with me mm -hmm. and and so it doesn't just become about catching them. And if, if they're really obstinate, I might, when I finally do catch them, I might just groom them or do something that they really, really, really like while I'm still trying to figure out what put them in this mind space in the first place. And when I can figure that out, I can ensure, well, I don't make that part of our relationship anymore because having them happy to come through the gate fills my heart with joy. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of relationship I want. And so that means I have to be willing to do the work. <laughs> mm. And 
takes a lot of work. I won't deny that. <laughs> but uh, I can say it's very rewarding, very rewarding. And oh. I will say that I don't believe for a minute that it's not something anybody and everybody can do. They just need to become mindful and aware of themselves and what they do possess and how to access it. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. How, how many horses do you have up there now, Mona? There's three. Okay. And all three are totally different. Uh, as, as I said, um, people give me stuff that they can't do anything with. And then I turn them into it. And usually, I never get rid of them. Usually, they're with me for their lives because some of these horses could, would not be okay around other mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, they 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 need me, so they're with me for as long as they're going to be breathing air. <laughs> and um, so, yeah. And yeah. I wish that I could take on lots, but I don't. I don't have those financial means, and I don't have the space and whatever. But yep, I've know. got I've got a two I've got a two limit. That's kind of my my limit at the moment. But one day it will it will increase. It's uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm excited yeah. for that point where I can I can add, <laughs> add a few more to the team. Yeah. Yes. But, uh, and, yeah. And you'll find this interesting. So every baby that I've ever raised, every foal, I have sold before they're four years old. Hmm. And um, everybody says, but they're such beautiful horses. And I go, yes, but they don't need me. Right. You know. Yep. I know the they're feeling. They're capable of, yep. of having handling whatever so they they don't need me and so i've given them everything and they're at a place where they're awesome and they can they can manage and and so yeah mm -hmm. so it's kind of an interesting thing they're here because they need me end yeah. of story wow. <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about it was it gem your the the stat the two-year-old stallion that came to you is he still a stallion no, no, he, he, he was gilded right away. <laughs> that was enough of that. And um, <laughs> he is uh, a bully. He is not a leader. And he has incredibly high self-preservation issues. So if he... He senses there's any kind of danger anywhere, and they're all loose in the field. He immediately starts biting and kicking the other horses to push them forward because he wants to push them past what he perceives as the danger oh area. My goodness. So if they make it past past the life, then he'll now he'll race past them and kick them behind because now he wants pass them behind because he doesn't want anything to eat them from behind, right? So. Uh, he's had these huge issues. <laughs> and so when I ride him, he uh, is really concerned, of course, what's going on behind him, way more concerned than what's in front of him because stuff might sneak up on him. Right, yeah. So the energy that I have to bring to the table and make him appear okay and he appears okay that everybody goes oh wow he's such a great horse and i'm like you yeah, have any idea how much energy i'm using to keep him in, in this controlled kind of state looking like this big dude nonchalant nothing really matters <laughs> so when i when i'm riding with other people or you know groups uh, Every day that I ride, I pretty much lose a pound a day, regardless of how much I'm eating, because the energy that he requires for me to maintain is more than I have ever, <laughs> ever had to put out in my life. 
but I have to use my energy to keep his heart rate slowed down. I have to keep my energy to try to keep his head in the game and not into a reactive state. Mm -hmm. And, um, and when I let other people ride him, it's so visual because he just puffs up into this white foamy thing. And, and then as soon as they get off and I get on, you just see him go. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and it's visual. Like people comment on it. So it's, it's a huge, huge thing, but you know, and he's been, the hardest horse I have ever had to work with because a of where I was at in my journey. Yeah. And the fears that I had, because of course, once you have one brain injury, you certainly don't want a second. And so all of those fears. And so trying to make me not a part of his fear well, that was a pretty big ticket item. And no over kidding. the course of my life with him, I've even had other people help me try to work with him. Like when my PTSD was at its worst, you could imagine what that did to him. So I would open the house door. He would feel that PTSD energy, no matter how badly I tried to hide it. And he'd run to the far end of the field. Mm -hmm. He wasn't coming anywhere near because I wasn't safe. And so if I had him at the end of the lead rope, he would be trying to rip the lead rope out of my hand and run by and kick me. And uh, I mean, it was a mess wow. Wow. for a while, a really powerful mess because he was speaking loud and clear. He didn't want to have any part of my energy, like get out of Dodge, <laughs> leave mm -hmm. me alone. And wow. yet I wanted a connection, right? And so pretty big acceptance things for me to have to come to a place to understand until I could get a handle on me. I was not the person that should be doing anything with him. I should just let him speak his mind and seek his safety <laughs> mm. and be okay with that. But I can tell you it was tough. It was really tough because when I needed my horses the most, they weren't there for me because I wasn't there for them, right? <laughs> totally. And, and, and so tough, tough pills to swallow, I can tell you. But anyhow, it forced me, like I keep saying, to up my game and get on with doing my work. So I could be back to where I am and being what I need to be for them. Yeah, well, and he's such an interesting, he sounds like a very much needed an anchor, you know, or needs an anchor from you or, you know, that I talk about that quite a bit on the podcast, you know, that sense of, and I think certain horses, like we see they're like, they're the anchor, right? They kind of anchor everybody else and they're, you know, they're chill and, oh yeah, no worries. I got this. And, you know, they're, they're kind of like, we, you know, we find them and we're like, oh, this is a one in a million horse. Like anything can be happening around them. They're like, I'm fine. <laughs> and then you get kind of everywhere on the spectrum towards your, your fellow, you know, where, yeah, they need some sense of sort of anchor from their people. Um, I have one client that I work with, um, a mare, and she takes a lot of like, uh, you know, a lot of safety comes from her person. And I remember one day, you know, I, I work with them regularly and I, um, her person had left, you know, the space for just a moment and, and immediately something happened because the mare, even just, just, um, her person leaving for that moment was, was so, um, she, she lost that anchor, um, in that moment. And I, I see that quite a bit, like, it, you know, it's the, the, um, that sense that I don't think we always realize how much our horses may depend on us in our state for their sense of safety. Oh, that is so correct. Uh, and I'll give an example with Gemini. So when Heather came up to do a Liberty clinic now uh heather will tell you differently but from my perspective i've never done liberty 
you know, I picture Liberty as these horses all running and somebody standing there and they're doing all this amazing stuff. Well, I've never done Liberty. <laughs> yeah. So I took Gemini to a Liberty clinic. <clears throat> and um, so my very first Liberty lesson, we get in there and um, by the end of my hour, He's doing figure eights around barrels. He's going through mazes. He's doing everything. Heather could not come up with a single thing that he and I could not do. And um, she was like, wow. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think you understand. He, I'm in a strange environment. He's in a strange arena. So my value to him right now is as high as it's ever going to be. Mm -hmm. because he's way out of his element here. So he's going to do everything. He's going to turn himself inside out to ensure he stays right in my circle of, of mm -hmm. whatever. And so I could never get him to do those things at home. He'd look at me and go, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm not invested in that. Screw you. <laughs> But he, I put him in a place where my value to him has increased. Rest assured, he, he can do a gazillion things. There's nothing wrong with his ability to read my language mm -hmm. or read my mind or to or <laughs> whatever. That's but, funny. And, but left to where I, here in my own yard where he feels safe, trying to get him to buy into something like that, Mm -hmm. Not likely, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And and so that's a really good example how you have to really understand what motivates your horse, what makes them willing, where they get their motivation from. Because if I wanted to motivate them here, I would certainly have to find something that had a higher value than my intrinsic value. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why we sometimes turn to treats or different things. I know, I know Heather, Heather's probably listening to this podcast and giggling and giggling. Um, and I laugh too because my, my young mare, I took to her place like a number of times for like liberty lessons. And Mona, it was, it was just a bit of a travesty. Like, like I, I was so, you would have had a good giggle because I was literally like wanting to have a temper tantrum in the middle of the arena because Raven was just like so stoked on all the new stuff and like there's horses and like I get to look at new things and there's new noises and she could, like I was, I didn't exist any longer, right? And it was like everything that I could do to get her to pay attention and, and Heather was like, okay, just don't wave the target around because I was like <laughs> waving. <laughs> yeah. Just like, I'm over here. I'm over here. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was quite a humorous scenario, uh, you know, albeit frustrating. And, you know, so it, it, it kind of, you know, but this is a very secure mare, very like, you know, well anchored for the most part. Not, she doesn't have like that, huge draw um to working or you know being engaged um yeah so it's it's very interesting to hear like these different you know along the spectrum these different horses yeah. and yeah what they can you know can and will and and want to you know share with us in those moments right yeah right and when and when you go for a lesson you have an intent you have something yeah. that you want to go and accomplish right and oh, so yeah yeah it was hilarious it, it, i was it, like it, in the arena like i'm spending 50 dollars on this <laughs> <laughs> you know and, and she doesn't and care so our, our our acceptance goes out the window oh, totally. because now now it's not about understanding where they're at it's like well the whole year this is what i want yeah and and then we forget there's because now it's no negotiation. Now we want to try to make them do what we want because hold it here. This is why I'm here. This yep. is what I want. Yep. And, oh, absolutely. I, I think that's a really hard place to get to 
because the acceptance has to be not only about where you're at and what you want and why you're feeling the way you're feeling, but it has to go the other way about where they're at and why they are the way they are and what they're doing and, and the why and kind of being okay with it in that moment and having the confidence to think that in the next moment to come, I wonder what else is going to happen mm -hmm. and having the curiosity to be open and and with that curiosity, you notice every little whisker change and every little mm -hmm. uh, muscle shift and change. And then you can engage yourself and go, oh, well, I wonder uh, if I walked over here, if I could see any kind of change in them. Yep. And, and then it takes you out of your, what you just lost, because now it's about totally. what you're gaining. Totally. by watching and observing and whatever and so yeah i mm -hmm. i i talk about that kind of thing a lot when i'm doing a workshop because we're human and we have objectives and we have places we're going and we have a game plan on how we're getting there and when we're with horses um that kind of has to a little bit go out the window because if they have a bit of a say. <laughs> and, Hopefully, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's... Yeah. You know, yeah. We, we, I think we talk about this idea of being partners, but, you know, I had a, my last podcast guest, she, she was like, yeah, me and my horse, we're, we're not there yet. You know, like, I can't say that about us yet. And I was like, that's really fair. I think that we're, we move towards that state of being and maybe in and out of that state of being. But, but I, I know for myself, like I, you know, it's my personal work is to let go of the part of me that wants to achieve a bunch or get something done or, you know, comes out with an agenda or, you know, and I, I think I speak for, for many riders and horse people when I say that, <laughs> I mean, I remember when, when we were in the same lesson and Heather's like, okay, so I'll let you set one rule. Like she's not allowed to lean on the fence, you know? And I was like, oh, thank God. Like, you know, it, was just, <laughs> it was something that I could control. And I was like, oh my gosh, this lesson is completely about me. It's not even about Raven. I mean, she's being fine. Like, but yeah, every, you know, I was like, just give me something that I can, you know, like, you know, tell her off around essentially. Right? And I'm like, this is so crazy that that's like where our mind goes. But it, it like left me with at least the sense, okay, I'm doing something right. And, and, um, but I, I hope to one day get to that place where it's like, okay, I don't need, I don't need her to do anything. And I can, I can set boundaries as I need them, but I, I don't like need those to feel like, you know, I'm doing something, you know, in the space. Um, yeah. this is really, really quite, it was quite a good, like self-learning <laughs> lesson. <laughs> And powerful, right? Yeah. And so I talk about judgment because whenever we have a judgment, that means our frame of reference has kicked into gear. And our frame of reference is our subconscious, something that we are unaware of, but it's ex extremely powerful. So when you're looking at your horse and you're thinking, well, this isn't going, well, that didn't happen. Well, those are all judgments. So uh, what I say is when you feel yourself having any kind of judgment, you have to stop and think about where that's coming from, why it's there, because this is all your stuff, mm. and find a way to throw it in the back seat. Because every time you have a judgment, you actually stop your energy flow. Because that <gasps> suck in as you have the judgment thought or feeling pulls your energy back in. And you actually lose the honesty connection with your horse. Because horses feel your energy way more than you realize. So mm. every time you suck it back, you're removing it and you're losing your connection. And pretty soon they lose interest. They get disengaged. Mm. And mm -hmm. so the mm -hmm. more open we can keep our energy then the more that energy means to them because in nature energy is is congruent until something knocks it 
uh, out of balance. And then that's usually a safety issue or there's some other issue in the environment they need to pay attention to. And so the more in line we can get of having that steady flow, mm. then we go all sorts of places in. So every time I tell everybody, so if you ever get anything kind of like judgment thing, or because people will say when they're overwhelmed, I can't do, that's a judgment thing. Mm -hmm. So let's just feel what you're feeling. Let's talk about what you're feeling and say it out loud. Let's get it out there because then we, we disperse mm -hmm. it. We don't mm -hmm. carry it because mm -hmm. as, as if, if we could learn anything, it's that, living in the moment means we're not thinking about what's coming ahead and we're certainly not dragging anything behind us mm. because all of those things impede our energy and when we want to have great relationships we need our energy to be consistent and fluent and as powerful as it can be so we have to start realizing we don't we can't, you know, yesterday wasn't a great day, but if I want to focus on yesterday, I'm not present for today. Mm -hmm. And I'm missing out on everything that today has to offer me because I'm thinking about yesterday or, or I'm thinking, well, maybe I don't know what I'm doing. Well, who cares if you don't know what you're doing? If you're open and present in the moment, you're going to be guided to wherever you need to be going because that information will be coming back to you and you'll be getting it. But if you're constantly worrying or holding, then you're missing out on what you're supposed to be getting from the universe. And, and the universe is there to give you everything that you need. We just need to clear our minds enough and our, and realize we don't need this. We can just be and um, accept and be happy and and allow that process to get us to where we're going rather than that, that agenda where we're step by step by step. And, and let me tell you, when, uh, before I had my accident and I had my business, every second of my day was accounted for. And I look back at my day planner, I think, my God, I did all that? That's like four people should have been doing that amount of work. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about being in the moment, I am well aware of the type A personality that I was and what I've had to do to get to where I am. Mm -hmm. And now where I am, I look back and I think, I wish somebody would have taught me this because I'm accomplishing just as much today as I was back then, but in a whole different manner. And the reward to myself is a hundredfold in my emotional and energy world. And the reward to everything else is they get all of me. I don't have anything. Well, I've got 20 minutes for this, so I better, you know, because that mm -hmm. was what would go on in my mind prior to being in the moment. Everything was accounted for. Well, I got to get out the door because I got an hour to make this happen. Okay, yeah, now, well, that's over. Yeah, well, now I'm on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and my life now is because sometimes I meet people and they go, well, living in the moment is impossible. And, and I realize why they feel that because they think living in the moment means you're doing nothing, <laughs> but living in the moment doesn't mean you're doing nothing. It means you're doing everything. It's just that you're cognizant of every emotion of everything that's coursing through your body. You're accepting it, mm -hmm. feeling it, acknowledging it, utilizing it and moving forward. And in that next moment, everything that you just were feeling is gone and you're, this is all new and, and you're not thinking about where you have to go, what you should be doing you're still going to go there. You're still going to pick the kids up after school. <laughs> but when you have your mm -hmm. hour and a half that you're doing something, you're totally in the moment doing it. And just like you're totally in the moment picking up your kids, you're not worried about going to the grocery store. You can think about the grocery store when you're in the grocery store. 
And so, so yeah. living in a moment doesn't mean you're just some sort of airy fairy person hanging out doing nothing all day long. It just means you're changing what you're carrying in your energetic body. Mm, that's that's so helpful. Yeah, and I I started with a new therapist yesterday. She said. Well, one of the first things she suggested, she's like, are you meditating right now? And I was like, I actually haven't been doing a practice as such. And, you know, I, I often kind of, because my work is quite meditative and I do, you know, my mucking is meditative. There's lots of meditative things, but, you know, she, she was really like, no, you need to sit. You need to actually be, you know, like take that time, carve that time out. And I was like... Yeah, I think that's a good plan. And I, I, you know, I even tried to do, I think 10 minutes last night and I was like, okay, yeah, I've got some work to do on presencing and being in the moment right now. Um, and yeah, like seeing how that can, that can really, really help us so much in all of our lives, but you know, especially with our horses, I mean, that's where they live all the time. So, you know, the, they relate to that way of being. Um, I think in, in the, the biggest way. So yeah, that's really, really helpful. Thanks, Mona. And we're, we're coming to the end of our time here. It's been a really wonderful chat. And I wanted to see if you've got any resources that you want to share, Mona, any, any people that you, you know, love working with or books that you're loving. Um, I was going to throw out, Alana Hunt, and okay. so she does some abundance meditations. And so I, like you, I would have a hard time during the day meditating because, uh, and you listen to them just before you go to sleep. And so I lay in bed with my headphones on and I listen to her, her uh, abundance one that brings you into alignment and helps you remove all the reasons why you don't have abundance in your life. And then the other one <clears throat> removes blocks. And so that one's meant to be listened to just before you go to sleep. And, and so I lay in bed and I listen and I'm asleep. And when I wake up, uh, everything's done its thing. It's worked on my subconscious. <laughs> Perfect. And, um, yeah. And I, I just, I thought of her when you're talking about, well, I, how am I going to do that? Well, so I find that works really well for me because I'm in bed anyhow and my day's ended and, and, uh, it's a nice way to kind of send off the day with, mm. uh, all Beautiful. the positive, uh, energy. Yeah. Awesome. And, um, I guess uh, the other thing that I, uh, I think is so amazing, and it's called Event Havening. Oh. And uh, so when, when people have uh, emotions that are attached to an event, so, and you know, when you recall the event, so you fell off your horse, now you're afraid. So, those things, every time we think about it, we recall that emotion. And then mm -hmm. that emotion eventually inside our body gets a real big groove in our neural pathways there. And so then now, not only do we have a physiological problem, but we have a psychological problem. So event happening is a little process where you recall the event and bring up the emotion and then you go through all these different steps and when you're done it takes about 15 minutes but you're left with the event but you have no emotion attached to it anymore mm. so you're able to totally disconnect the power that it has on your vagus nerve which is part of what keeps you locked into um dragging the past with you because those memories are always there and always being triggered by certain things. And so I use that when I teach my workshop so that uh, I put everybody through that and have them pick so they can see how powerful it is. And um, so I, I think everybody should look up event happening because it's absolutely the most powerful little thing you're ever going to do. And 
Right. Freeing, liberating. Yeah. Get rid of all that stuff. You don't need to drag it anymore. I, I love, you know, they, there is more and more things out there that way. Uh, I haven't looked this one up. You know, I've done emotion code and EFT and different things. So I, I'll, I'm really excited to look that up, that process and, um, and share it with, with the listeners and always with resources. If you're listening to this on iTunes or Spotify, you can head to wholehorse.ca and, and you'll find the resources there under the episode. So you can check those out. That's awesome. Thank you, Mona. And, and how do people get in touch with you? Um, they can go on Facebook. Partner Up PG is my Facebook page. Or they can uh, email me at partnerupworkshop at gmail.com. I will have that all on the resource page as well. Um, and uh, I've so appreciated our chat together, Mona, today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. As always, blessings and have a great day. Hi, all, and thanks for tuning in. It's so good to be back. My exams are done, and I'm feeling my creative juices coming back online. And I'm excited to share that I have opened the registration for the Whole Horse Apprenticeship for 2021, starting September 15th. So if that's something that's been on your mind, on your heart, and something that interests you, you can check it out. Uh, I've included the link in the resources, or you can go to alexalinton.com slash apprenticeship-2021 to find out more. All right, wishing you all so well and looking forward to connecting more and more over the coming months. Mm-hmm.